Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about the 100 Club organization, which supports first responders with guests, Caitlin Brennan, CEO of the 100 Club of Chicago, Angela Harold, President and CEO of the 100 Club of Arizona, and William Skeen, Executive Director of the 100 Club of Houston. Thank you all for joining us. I so look forward to this discussion. It's so important. Last year before COVID hit, um, close to 150 uh, police and firefighters died in the line of duty. And that was 19, uh, 2019. And that doesn't really touch the reality of what first responders and their families face, particularly in this COVID era, where first responders cannot protect themselves as they're protecting us. And there is a personal price to be paid. Let's go around the room and talk about how you each define the issue of support of our first responders so that they can have confidence that as they're supporting society, society is supporting them. And let's start with uh, Caitlin over in Chicago. Sure. So I think that um, that COVID kind of highlights the the issue that that is always present, that first responders are going and showing up every day to do these jobs, um, whatever it is that they're facing. And all across our nation, we see what those different challenges are. Um, a lot of weather-based challenges, whether that's disease challenges, whether it's national disasters or emergencies, but our first responders respond every day. They go out and put themselves in harm's way. Um, and what we do in our separate organizations is make sure that they know that they've got us behind them and that they know that their families will be taken care of if anything happens. We serve as advocates, but we also serve um, as support systems for them and their families. And it's an organized response, isn't it, to a situation that is not to be anticipated by an individual, but, but if you look at first responders as a group, we can anticipate the need, can't we, Carol, uh, uh, Angela, in, in terms of in terms of knowing that families are going to need support and we can organize for that in advance. Yes, we can be prepared on different levels, obviously in response to a death that occurs in the line of duty for not only law enforcement, but our firefighters. We can be prepared on the financial level, but many of us will never understand what it's like to walk in their shoes. So we wanna make sure that we're there for them, obviously with that financial support, but also long-term emotional support and making sure they have resources that they that we have available to us to make sure they have the right equipment, um, that we're doing anything that we can do that's proactive and addressing mental health concerns as associated as well. And William, could you talk about how you see the, the challenges that you're facing? Sure, yeah, you mentioned, you mentioned us here. You know, we started in 1953 assisting just Houston police officers. We've now expanded to 32 counties around Houston and certain state officers in Texas. So. We unfortunately are pretty good at what we do and we have a huge member base. We've got about 30,000 members that assist those men and women in law enforcement and firefighting every day so that they can go out properly equipped, safe, and if the ultimate price is paid by these men and women, we're there to assist those families and help those kids go to college and take care of their debt. And uh, you know, for instance, today we've got flash flooding in Houston. I saw on the news earlier some of the boats we'd purchased for first responders are out there working right now. And those men and women are out there right now as we speak, rescuing citizens, taking care of them. Um, talk about the articulation of the social compact and, and as it affects um, the whole idea of first responding, right? We in America have developed these, these groups, right? Some of them are governmental groups. Some of them are at, at a uh, federal level. Some of them are at a local level. Some of them are at state level. Um, we have nonprofits. We, we basically come together to solve problems. You were talking about buying boats, right? Houston is flooded regularly. It would yeah. seem that having boats available <laughs> during the flood would be kind of a no-brainer. Talk about how you think about that idea of having a nonprofit through private donations by boats uh, that would seem to be essential uh, equipment for your first responders? Well, exactly. You know, the, the purpose of the club was originally to take care of injured officers and firefighters. They started proactively thinking 
in the 60s and 70s when bulletproof vests were first were first created to let's try to protect these officers. Let's see what we can do. And the club for 67 years has done what they can to purchase life protecting equipment, helmets, radios, bulletproof vests, armored vehicles. And as the flooding increased in Houston, we saw officers and firefighters putting themselves in harm's way with, with not, while not properly equipped. Our member base thought that would be a great idea in our board and we purchased the boats to help protect them. So that's what we've done for our whole focus is to help these officers, firefighters proactively anticipate any needs they may have and be there when a tragedy occurs. And you can take a, a multi-pronged approach, right? It doesn't mean that somebody has failed, but while you know, the, the cogs of government are, are grinding and there are debates about whether it's boats or bulletproof vests, you can decide that right now we need boats and you can just make a decision and if you have the money, buy some boats. It's incredible our speed. I'm a retired state officer and I saw the speed that government worked in my career in law enforcement, very slow, very arduous. We're able to instantly identify a need when there is a need by these agencies. And within 30 days, we can purchase the equipment they need, cutting out all those loops, getting it in their hands and making their job safer. Do you all see that there uh, much of a distinction between the various regions of the, of the country in terms of the needs of officers, of firefighters, of, of different first responders? I'm including the EMT, the health first responders. Do you th do you feel that it's that it's kind of um, uh, Caitlin, it, the red state, blue state stuff is 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 not a big issue. Uh, it's just basically first responders have a lot in common and the needs are, are very similar, or do you see the distinction here in, in a place like Chicago, which is, I guess, a, a, you know, a, a, a very blue area, um, uh, a place like Houston would be, a, 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 or, uh, or that part of Texas, uh, perhaps a little bit more red. Does that really make a difference, or, or, or does it make a difference? I think that the needs of first responders is, is national, so they're all going to need the same basic things. Um, I think what the ability to have these clubs targeting certain regions is that we don't have fires like Arizona does. We don't have flooding like Texas does, but we have massive snowstorms. <laughs> um, and we also have, have some other different, um, you know, non-climate related issues in Chicago that aren't necessarily across the nation. But I think that the, the power is being able to say, this is what the hot item button is for Chicago and for Illinois. And here's where we can help patch. Here's where things fall through the crack with the government or with grants that are avail available federally. Um, and that's where we can help. That's where we can assist. You referred to the, to the non-climate related issues in Chicago. Chicago, of course, is a center for uh, gun violence um, and, and very well known. There are racial tensions that are articulated in different communities in different ways. One of the things that, that I find, Angela, is that um, you have trauma that is experienced on all sides, where you have, on the one hand, uh, the welcome support of law enforcement during a flooding event, a fire event, a snowstorm, um, yet you also have fear that exists on both sides in different communities. Um, how does trauma affect, and the trauma today that is coming out, right, whether it's pandemic trauma, or, or um, the issue with Black Lives Matter and, and distrust with, uh, uh, you know, among certain communities and the criticism that officers receive and are trying to respond to and are trying to figure out a balanced way to, to do their job. How does that affect you, Angela, in Arizona? How does it affect you, uh, William, in Houston? And then Caitlin will come back to you in, in, um, in uh, Chicago. Angela, you want to take a first cut at, at this idea of trauma on, on all sides? Sure, absolutely. Trauma it has a ripple effect. There are several different components of trauma that we need to look at. And there was a study done just in 2015 talking about how it, an officer might experience up to 188 critical incidents during their career. 
a critical incident is different for everyone. It could be working in that flooded area. It could be working in that blizzard condition. Or for us in Arizona, we have a lot of fires, wildland fires, and a lot of people are dispatched even outside the state of Arizona. So those traumas can be can be multi-layered so they can affect not only the individual but the department and then bringing it back even into the family arena. Now we cover the entire state and we're extremely honored to do so and we want to make sure that our goal is to get ahead of it, um, try to be proactive or uh, make immediate resources available to them. So we've implemented two apps that exist like I said to every law enforcement and fire agency throughout the state of Arizona called Bulletproof, obviously on the law enforcement side, and then Fireproof on the fire side. Now those apps provide immediate resources to mental health and wellness needs of our public safety officers in the event that they do experience a trauma. So now they can go to their phone and they can, whenever the time is appropriate, get immediate counseling needs, therapy needs met. And then we can also take that and offer that to the families. Now the families have resources as well. So you talk about traumas, obviously there's that continual neg negative rhetoric that we're experiencing here in 2020. And you know, it started with the COVID and went to curfew and we're kind of seeing uh, lingering uh, components of both. But those traumas, again, focusing on that trauma piece, they're so, so impactful on every level. We want to make sure that the spouses at home are receiving access to need, access to resources as well. We've implemented weekly spousal support groups in Arizona because they are experiencing bricks being thrown through their front windows that say hashtag Black Lives Matter. And that front window might actually be into their children's bedroom. They have people that are loosening lug nuts on vehicles that are associated with law enforcement. It is scary. It's scary for the children. It's scary for the spouses. And then also, of course, with the law enforcement or potentially firefighter as well. Again, for us, it's staying ahead, trying to be re reactive when necessary and immediate to whatever the climate change might be that affects our, our public safety members. We have to talk to each other, don't we? we just Absolutely. Have to, we have to talk with each other. And you know, 180 traumatic incidents is like 180 gut punches. Mm -hmm. it's a, it, you know, it has an effect, it has a physical effect. William, how do you see this, this whole issue? How do we resolve it? We can't, we can't resolve it by saying, I'm too tough, or la, 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 you know, or not talking to each other. But we don't seem as a society that needs to come together to have found a way to bring people into conversation about their trauma, their different traumas. Yeah, I think, you know, there's traumas in, in public service, police, firefighting, those traumas are brought home to the family, the families are impacted every day, an officer or firefighter goes to work not knowing if they're going to come back, and those traumas are real. It's being talked about a lot more now among the first responders, the mental health of these folks, and the, the toll it takes doing what they do. You know, men and women get into the public service sector to serve people. They're colorblind, they're out there to help people, whoever needs them, they want to work, they want to serve. You know, our role here at the 100 Club is to do what we can to keep them safe while they're serving our community, serving their fellow man, and some peace of mind to them and their family if they're seriously injured or killed in the line of duty. That's one piece that that officer or firefighter doesn't have to worry about. They can focus on going out, serving, doing their job safely, knowing that at least that part of the, the, the family situation is going to be taken, to, taken care of and assisted in the ultimate uh, tragedy occurs. And uh, we just took a poll uh, where we where we asked uh, in the last year have has have, have the responder uh, respondents been personally helped by a first responder and thank them. I mean, just saying thank you. I, I, I go to every uh, traffic cop and I walk over and I say thank you so much for directing traffic. I mean, the fact is, is just saying thank you is 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 really important. And, and we say thank you to each other every day. We ought to include the people who, who serve every day. It's a little gesture, but it's a nice thing to do. Caitlin, how do you see this, this, this being uh, addressed? Chicago is famously in the news uh, very often for the divisions. How do you see your role in trying to uh, help that, um, help to heal those divisions? Sure. So I think one of the biggest things that we can do, um, and, I, and I say this a lot, is there's power in the fact that we don't have a badge. 
we are able to advocate for firefighters and, and police officers. And it's not coming from the inside, it's coming from the out. We're able to make that thank you even louder because we see the traumas and we see the benefit of having our first responders serving. Um, you know, we serve three counties in, in Northern Illinois, but you know, we see that benefit and we're able to have those conversations. And I think for us, this has been a time where we're looking at how we can pivot and how we can help further um, you know, offer some programming and, and make that impact bigger on our first responder community. Are you able to affect the policies and procedures, whether it's procurement of boats or, or the, the dealing with trauma and, and breaking down sort of the, the uh, 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 macho culture that could be a barrier to, uh, to, to talking about issues that, that we have? Are you having an effect on the culture of the various departments in ways that um, improve the whole treatment of people who who choose this and their families who choose this as a career. Angela, you were uh, mentioning the whole impact on families. Um, are, are, are you able to affect the culture and, and practices? I'm actually thrilled that you asked because absolutely, we've done a few different things in Arizona. And again, in light of 2020, which is such a unique environment for all of us, we've been able to I I impact culture is a great way to put it. You know, we can impact families one-on-one, -on -one, but we can impact culture and make that change if we get into the departments and we start with the academies and we work with them throughout their career. So what we've done, for example, you, you've got to pivot, as Caitlin mentioned, and one of the things we're doing is we are doing webinar series. Every week we're doing three to four different webinars to get into the departments to make it accessible to all of our public safety so that they have the resources to deal with maybe the financial challenges that have resulted, whether they are emotional challenges, stress related, health concerns, whatever it may be. We're getting in front of them in their homes via Zoom, like I said, via webinars every week, the spousal support groups. We are working and offering training to the departments throughout the entire state of Arizona so that they have all of the resources that they need, whether it may be uh, support for critical incidents, whether it's peer support components, whether it's access to technology, whatever it is. Again, we're trying to get in at the academy level continue to offer those weekly webinars and trainings at the department when they are deemed appropriate. And then of course, offering the same resources to family members so that they continue to, they can continue to grow and understand that culture of which their loved one works in and be available to them in the event that things do go sideways. We just finished another poll and we, we asked about uh, the, the biggest challenge faced by first responders. And it's interesting, three, three areas received the greatest uh, attention. One is the physical danger of the job. Uh, second is the lack of community moral support and understanding. And the third area was insufficient support uh, dealing with trauma, which is just part of the job. You know, this is where it seems that, that the, the issues that, where, where we seem to be using polarized language can actually come together. When people are talking about defund the police, right? What we're all talking about is, is shifting how resources are used and really having a dialogue of where those resources can be used wisely, right? If trauma is a big issue, if physical danger is a real issue, if certain equipment is a real issue, then we can invest in ways that change to, to meet those, those issues, right? Whether it's buying boats or buying um, uh, protective gear, or helping, as, as you say, Angela, in, in providing uh, uh, trauma-informed practices, uh, shifting culture, we can actually change. And maybe we bring people together instead of yelling at each other and say, yes, no, yes, no. Maybe there's a gray area where it's kind of both, right? We can, we can actually change our behaviors and do it in, in dialogue with each other. William, could you comment on, on that whole idea of moving beyond this and sort of conceding that each side might have a point and maybe we can come together, talk it out and, and, uh, and create some shifts? Yeah, I think, I think uh, in law enforcement and firefighting, it's continually evolved. You look at policing in, in Texas and America in a hundred years, they've evolved, they've addressed changes, they've tried to get better. The young folks in the academies right now, 23, 24 years old, 
they're there to serve and their reality of policing is going to be a lot different than mine was uh, years ago when I became an officer. And the departments as a whole are always trying to train up their folks, do the right thing and move the policing. And, you know, the police officers and firefighters are one of us. They just put on a badge every day. They're not any different. And so when you make that communication happen and understanding that's going to move the whole thing forward. And, you know, we're there as a club to kind of move forward with them, whatever those needs may be. You, you mentioned about thanking folks. That's what we, we try to do here. You know, we, we provide the equipment, the assistance. We do annually, we, we thank officers by honoring their heroic actions and firefighters every year. That's one night a year where they're able to bring their families together and highlight the good things in policing, the good things in firefighting and honor them among their peers and their other officers and firefighters for why they go into this career. And they're not doing it for the money, it's because they're, they're servant hearts and they want to take care of their fellow man and anything we can do to advance that, uh, you know, that, that, that's great. Uh, we just got a, a uh, comment by Lanny Medina, who made reference to his father, who started Lake County Blue Coats in Northeast Ohio in 1965, which still thrives today. And he, he just wanted to draw um, attention to the fact that, you know, we all are, uh, and it basically is, is your point, William, right? In the West, we're not suffering floods, we're suffering fires. Floods will come in the aftermath of the fires. Right, and then you have first responders, law enforcement, firefighters, um, people who um, are even unaccustomed. We're having military uh, folks coming in uh, to help in this. Um, very often, in order to um, to process what you've experienced, William, what families have experienced, uh, people move into providing support in these types of organizations to help themselves process and help their communities process. Can you talk a little bit about how you got involved and how the, the people who, are, who surround you have gotten involved? What are the motivations and how does that actually help to heal and continue the energy, the positive energy uh, towards service? Um, uh, Caitlin, let's, you haven't spoken in a while. How did you get involved in the 100 Club? Um, and, and if you could just uh, give a sense of the personal stories of people who are surrounding you. Uh, that, that created this motivation toward continued public service? I've been with the club for seven years. Um, I started, I've had a, a lifetime of public service, but I started um, targeting working with our students who are in higher education. So our, our dependent children um, and spouses. We do a Hunter Club educational assistance program. So I started working with that and kind of moved into this position over those seven years. Um, the people who surround us, the people in the three counties we serve and our, our board members um, are people in the community who say, we understand that we need our first responders and we're here to help and let us know how. And I think that, that, that piggybacks and everything we've been talking about, you know, there, there's the ability to give first responders things that they need that aren't offered to them or aren't part of, you know, their budgets or part of um, basically what the public sees or what the higher up see as the need. So everyone who's involved with our hundred club um, has said, we appreciate the service and we're here to help and let us know how. Um, and we create support nets around our families and around our first responders. And Angela, how did you get involved? Well, I got involved the hard way. I uh, actually started out and spent a decade as a federal agent and I fell in love with a gentleman who happened to be a police officer, a firefighter, and a paramedic in Arizona. And unfortunately, he lost his life in the line of duty. He was killed during a helicopter rescue in Sedona, rescuing two lost and dehydrated hikers. So that was my first involvement and exposure to the 100 Club was actually as a recipient, as someone who was benefited because when this happened, and I, we're going way back now, but in 2008, our, our economy took a huge turn. So that financial support was incredibly beneficial to my small children and myself. And ever since that moment, I wanted to figure out a way to pay it forward, to get back involved. And um, from the, not only the law enforcement perspective, but as a survivor perspective, as a spouse, and as a mother to two children who may have long-term needs like schooling and education, et cetera. So 
I had the opportunity to start working with the 100 Club in different capacities, but initially it started in that mental health focus. Um, the suicide awareness piece, we started developing a suicide awareness program, and that is one of the big numbers that often is not addressed. You know, we talked earlier that, you know, we have an average of 150 officers that lose their life in the line of duty every single year to what we call a true line of duty death. But we far exceed that number when it comes to suicide and how it affects our law enforcement. That number usually exceeds 150 per year. And that is a, that's a trauma in and of itself to our culture, to our public safety culture, and that exists on both sides, not only law enforcement, but fire. So came into the role in that capacity and later was fortunate enough to be asked to move into their CEO role of which I've been in now for five years. And I've been able to take these experiences that I've had only not only personally, but walking in the shoes of others and helping other families throughout this process and giving them perspective and guidance of how best to move forward and how, how to channel that energy and affect change affect the culture, get involved early, and make sure they're there with their loved ones, that they have simple things like their personal emergency documents in place, little things that we don't think of on a day-to-day -day basis that will long-term affect these families. You know, first of all, I want to, I want to just express um, my deep, deep um, feeling for what you, your husband, your community are doing to help us all. Um, that idea of, of service in support of others, in a rescue of somebody who you don't know, who just happens to be in America, who happens to need, um, and that willingness um, is, is stunning, and we all need to think about that. So, well, I thank you. It's, it's quite honorable on so many levels to be able to be involved and to be able to give back and support. And what you mentioned is that rescue. We often don't think about the fact that we call 911 on our very worst day or on someone else's worst day. You don't just call it nonchalantly. And when those first responders show up, we expect them to show up with their A game. They don't get to say, my back hurts, or I didn't get enough sleep. They show up to your emergency to fix your situation the best possible way, without question, without hesitation. And they deserve that thank you. We are just now on the heels of Thank a Police Officer Day, which happened to be just this past Saturday. I think this is something that we should not have to celebrate once a year. We should do every day. Uh, we in Arizona are fortunate to do that via our license plate. Uh, we have a license plate that says supporting public safety, and that's our, that's our mantra, so to speak, is say thank you every day. Say thank you while they're serving and they're active, not just when they're gone. This is important. We need to understand that they have a servant mentality, that they are out there day in and day out, whether, whether they got enough sleep or their back hurts or their, or their kid might have a program and they miss holidays. It's important for us to be there for them and say thank you for their service so that we can continue to provide that positive reinforcement despite the negative rhetoric that exists. And we must not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. who, who amongst us provides perfect service in every sense? Who amongst us doesn't trip um, at, at a certain time, right? And so that's, that can't be the standard. The perfect cannot be the standard. We're trying to form a more perfect union. Let's continue to strive and, and recognize our imperfections. William, could you comment on, on this whole issue of, of uh, mutual support and, and how that has unfolded in your life, how you got involved? Sure. You know, the club started in 1953. 100 people that cared about law enforcement came together to raise money for the widow of a police officer. Fast forward in my career as a game warden, I was a state game warden for almost 27 years. Uh, I saw firsthand when we had officers injured in the line of duty, how the club assisted them in a serious injury. When I promoted up through the ranks, became a supervisor and didn't have the funding to purchase bulletproof vests for the men and women that served underneath me, the club purchased those items. So I saw that. We bought rescue bags, things to keep officers safe. The club was always there to assist. Ultimately, when we had game wardens that were killed in the line of duty, I saw firsthand what the club did to assist those families. Uh, after almost 27 years, uh, uh, came towards retirement, and uh, I was interviewed, uh, asked to interview for the position, interviewed against some other uh, folks for this position, and was asked to come over and be executive director. 
And I can tell you firsthand what it's meant to me and my family to have this group out here when I was patrolling, when I was working. My brother's currently an HPD Houston Police Sergeant. And I know what that means to all of these officers and their families of what we do and how we're there to assist them. So it's a, it's a it, I don't feel like I'm working every day. I'm doing what's truly in my heart to assist these families, to take care of them and get whatever they need to help do their jobs better. Incredible organization to be a part of. Again, I'm blessed to do it, blessed to serve these men and women in police and fire service. And you made a, a really important point, which is underscored by the poll that we just took. You made the point that by talking to each other by service, and uh, Angela, you and, and Caitlin, you also made the point, we can evolve practices so that law enforcement, the next generation of law enforcement is an evolved version of this generation. And we are an evolved version of the past generation. We asked whether should the culture training or personnel mix of first responders change based on points made during recent protests where people are just yelling at each other. And what's interesting is that two thirds said, said yes. And the rest of the third said someone. There's not a single person who said no. This is all part of this, right? The whole idea of identifying need, having dialogue, changing practice, dealing with trauma, um, what you are doing at the 100 Club is part of that change and making um, the, the world a better place and engaging first responders, their families, and supporting uh, first responders' families is a big part of that. I'd like to thank you all for, for sharing your, your uh, work with us. Um, Angela, let's give you the last word since I just saw you unmute your, your mic. Um, <laughs> What would you like to, uh, to take us out on? What is the point that we should all remember? Well, I love the idea of just saying thank you. Whether they are a firefighter who runs into a home who is face to face with COVID on a regular basis, or whether they are police officers working in protest, making sure that we have um, a peaceful situation where we can all get up and go to work every day. You brought up another good point in that there, is, there are bad apples that doesn't ruin an entire industry. And through training and through just public discussion like we're having now, we can let people know that everyone's doing their best. And if there are challenges, we work through them as an organization like the 100 Club here or Texas or Illinois, we can, we can affect change from the outside. We don't have to be part of that government circle. We can sometimes offer individuals access to resources that they don't normally have within their department. And together we can do more and if we continue to stand by them, they will stand by us. Absolutely, right? Perfect is not the standard. Becoming more perfect, becoming more perfect, understanding our imperfections and dealing with those in a forthright way, talking with each other, that's the standard, isn't it? Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, uh, participants. That's the nonprofit report. Uh, let's continue to support each other. Stay safe during this COVID era. And thank you all for, for coming and joining us uh, at the various uh, 100 clubs in Chicago, in Arizona, in Texas. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.